Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. What a wonderful occasion this is. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Williams family and um, talk a little bit about Neil, uh, whose legacy these lectures are. If you're familiar with Neil Ask, these are a series of lectures that really were born out of Neil's untimely death. And uh, what his family mostly said was, you know, Neil was so fully engaged in life and always asking good questions. And so this series of lectures, sponsored by many of the organizations and institutions that were nearest and dearest to Neil's heart, and he was certainly near and dear to this community, uh, have been exploring those things. And so our question today, uh, as you know, is in what ways can music be a gateway to the holy and unify people around a shared vision or mission? And so that is what we are uh, going to be exploring today. But I did want to, again, just thank Sue and her children, uh, Fred and Susan and Kathy, uh, Fred's wife, and, and um, Taylor, who is a grandchild who actually serves on the Neil Ass board, Alex, a grandchild who could not be here, and Neil's sister Sue and her husband Jim, uh, and then Sue's extended family. We're just really grateful. Um, Sue's laughing at me for not mentioning, uh, mentioning everyone, but um, the... Uh, I, w I was wanting to get started right on time, and Norman kept saying, no, 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 the symphony crowd knows we're going to start five minutes late. <laughs> Um, so I don't know about that rule, but anyway, um, I also want to thank the Worship and Music Committee uh, under the leadership of Nell Robinson and Patty Hines, who have worked so hard to make this uh, event possible. And, um, and I, I just wanted to read an excerpt from Neil's memorial service homily. Perhaps one of the things Neil loved about music was how it holds the weight of the mysteries of life and faith. Great music has a depth and complexity that draws us in and makes us participants in these mysteries. It does not explain them. It exposes them and explores them. And so we are so grateful for Neil's legacy and for uh, this opportunity to enter into those mysteries together under the leadership of Dr. Jeremy Begbie, who I'm going to have Norman introduce. They've been longtime friends. I had the pleasure of meeting Jeremy last night, and I'm grateful to call him a friend now as well. So Norman McKenzie, who Thanks. needs no introduction. I know so many of you, and I am so thrilled to see you all here on a dreary day. It's not going to be dreary in this room, I can promise you, and you're in for a rare treat, as you will see in just a second. You can read Jeremy's very, very impressive credentials uh, within this little program, but I would just like to say, uh, I'd also like to say, wouldn't Neil have been thrilled about this? Wouldn't he have been absolutely passionate about exactly what we are doing today? And thank you, Neil, uh, for being the catalyst for such a wonderful thing. And thank you, Sue, for making it possible. Uh, I became a great friend immediately of Jeremy's uh, five years ago when he came here to teach a class. I had heard about him. I had read some of his books. I had never uh, met him until that point, And I realized within the first 30 seconds that we were kindred spirits. But not only that, that I was hearing some, somebody with an absolutely a wonderful, keen, and probing intellect and with a unique and visionary perspective on exactly what we are going to be talking about this afternoon. The intersection between theology and the arts, and more specifically, theology and music. Uh, Jeremy has a completely dynamic and fresh perspective on this, and he articulates it in a very exciting way. And I've, we've been trying to get him back to do something like this ever since our first meeting, and I'm delighted that he is here today and uh, without further ado, I, I, I will say one thing. <laughs> I can't, I was going to get him up here, but I, I, I cannot let this pass. Some of you were here this morning at the 11 o'clock service where Jeremy preached, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons you're back here this afternoon. Uh, at that point, I would just like to say, Jeremy, the check is in the mail for all those <laughs> lovely things you said about me. <laughs> and the choir will never let me live them down. So you've caused me a great deal of trouble already today. Thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jeremy Baker. Thanks so much. Thank you. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norman. Wonderful to call Norman and Pam, now indeed my friends. I mean that most sincerely, an honor. 
And thank you, Sue and the Neil Ask Board for this extraordinary invitation. My memories of Neil are vivid and warm, a big man in every sense. I'll be forever grateful for his warm encouragement to me. And perhaps the highest compliment I can pay him is that he completely restored my trust in lawyers. <laughs> uh, one of Neil's abiding passions, of course, was music, as we've been hearing. Well, I remember the way he and Sue listened to a rehearsal in King's College Chapel, Cambridge. I was playing the piano in a two-piano work, and I didn't tell him I was very anxious about the balance between the two pianos, but halfway through the rehearsal, he called me over to say, by the way, the balance is perfect. <laughs> and that was very typical of him. Our question this afternoon, in what ways can music be a gateway to the holy and unite people in a shared vision? It's a question that would have fascinated Neil, I'm sure. Not so long ago, I was asked to play some piano music before a wedding service at a Presbyterian church. I'm not a Presbyterian myself, but it's a Presbyterian church near Duke. The idea, I was told, to unite the congregation in an atmosphere of reverent expectation as the guests arrived, as a kind of gateway for the service to come. But as the congregation grew, so did the noise level. This lot just wouldn't stop chattering. In little groups all over the church, the louder I played, the more the conversations multiplied. I tried everything from Bach to Rachmaninoff. Nothing would get this bunch of hyper-talkative American Presbyterians to shut up. <laughs> but I just couldn't... <laughs> I, I couldn't grab their attention as one body. And then I thought, well, yes, maybe. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Absolutely. The theme tune from Downton Abbey bonded them in rapt silence. It seemed to dig deep into their psyches, stirring up rumors of a home they'd long forgotten. <laughs> Half-remembered British accents, green summers, country gardens, dressing up for dinner, going upstairs to take your hat off. The music was uniting them around their sense of inner colonial, uniting them in a shared vision of Englishness. And now we were ready for the service of holy matrimony. <laughs> in what ways can music be a gateway to the holy and unite people in a shared vision? A pretty trivial example, perhaps, but it provokes the question, what is it about music that does these things? Why has there been so much music in the Christian church? Why so much music in this building, week after week? offering a gateway to the holy and uniting people in a shared vision. I want to talk about three powers of music, and just three, that may offer a clue, and there's three among many. And these are very much conversation starters in the spirit of Neil, who was such an eminent conversationalist, and I'm looking forward greatly to my distinguished colleagues and their conversation later. First thing, let's think about the way music mixes sounds. Think about the way we see the world and contrast it with the way we hear the world. When a painter paints red and yellow on the same space on a canvas, the colors will either hide each other or the paint's wet, they'll turn into orange. That's what we can see at any rate, either red or yellow or a merger of the two. We can't see red and yellow in the same space as red and yellow. Objects in our visual field occupy bounded zones, and those zones can't overlap without hiding each other or turning into something else. You can't see two different things in the same place as different. Now, that picture of objects that can't overlap in the same space while being different may sound innocent enough, but it's caused a lot of trouble in our culture. It's often been used to picture how people get along with each other, or don't. We've each got our own space, our own zone, and the best we can do is tolerate each other. It's as if we're all vying for the same space, and the best we can hope for is to put up with each other. I won't get in your way if you don't get in mine. We can't occupy the same space. And there's something very barren about that picture 
of human relations. Now, the picture has also caused a lot of trouble when thinking about God. Christians talk of the Trinity, God as three in one. How can you have three persons as distinct and still talk about God as one? Very hard with the eyes, because we can't see three things in the same space as three. But in the world we hear, things are different. If I play a note, that note or tone fills the whole of my oral space, my heard space. It doesn't occupy a space with edges. It fills the whole of the space we hear. Suppose I play a second note along with that first note. That second tone also fills the same heard space, the whole of the space I hear, yet I hear it as a different note. In the world as we hear it, two things can be in the same space at the same time and be heard as different. Or to put it another way, notes don't have to get in each other's way. Of course they can, especially if the tenor in the choir sings too loud, but they don't have to. And they don't have to merge into something else. They can sound through each other, interpenetrate, while being audible as two distinct tones. And let's not forget another feature of vibrating strings that we can hear. If I play, um, if I take this key and I depress it slowly and it takes the damper off the string and I strike the note one octave below, I can set this note off without playing it. Can you hear that in the front row? I hope that's spreading. I didn't play that note. I simply let the string vibrate. And that's because that upper note is the first harmonic of the lower note. Inside that lower note, there's a bit of that. And the upper note is saying, hey, I'm in there. And it's starting to vibrate. Please note, the lower string sets off the upper string. The more the lower string sounds, the more the upper string sounds. And we can hear that. The notes we hear don't simply tolerate each other. The lower string frees the upper to be itself. What's more, when certain other strings are opened up beside these strings or in line with these strings, we'll hear other strings come to life, or we might. Let's see if we can get some of these going, shall we? So I didn't play any of those notes. They were all set off, liberated by the lower notes. What have we got here? Through mixing its sounds, music offers an intense experience of unity, while at the same time preserving and enhancing difference in the same space. And it can do that like no other art form. Last time I was here, I think I played a minute or two of this piece, Spem in Allium, by Thomas Tallis, which is a ridiculously over-the-top, extravagant 40-part motet from the 16th century, about 1573. Here, 40 different voices singing, in effect, 40 different melodies weave their way in and out through each other. And, but despite this sonic profusion, it never sounds jammed or crowded. Each voice is enabled to become more fully itself. That would sound very good in this acoustics, so that's next week's project, all right? It happens to be quite a hard piece. Those, pe those voices don't just tolerate each other, they set each other off. They enhance each other. And what's that got to do with the gateway to the holy? I'm sure you've got that already, the holy trinity. Very hard to visualize, threeness and oneness together. In a three-note chord, really quite easy to hear a three-note resonance of life, interpenetrating, each one setting the other off, 
intensely one, yet undeniably three. Here we have a very different way of thinking about the Trinity that the church has largely neglected because it's been obsessed with visual models of the Trinity. And this is far more biblical than most of the models we churn ch out in the Christian church. Far more biblical. Okay, so that's the first thing, mixing sounds. Second thing to think about, music creating emotional empathy. This is another way music creates unity and a, a sense of shared vision. And by empathy here, I mean just broadly the ability to discern and even share in and align yourself with the emotional state of another. In a few weeks' time, I'll be playing a two-piano work with this pianist, uh, Cordelia Williams, London player. This is me here. We played this uh, a few years back in King's College Chapel. This is uh, where this is. This is a piece by Messiaen called Vision de la Men. Um, it's extraordinary. I only saw this this morning. But you look very carefully in the audience there. And there is Neil. And I think that's Sue. Am I right? I just discovered it this morning, and we're playing this again uh, in about, well, it's about a month's time now. Just to go back then to Cordelia. Cordelia here is a very reserved English person, but in a very Downton Abbey sort of way. She's very hard to read when you speak to her. Not standoffish, but reserved. But when she starts to play, or I start to play with her, I know in a few seconds what's going on in her and vice versa, and there's an immediate rapport between us. Now, one of the reasons why music is so empathetically powerful is because it hooks deeply into bodily gestures and patterns that have emotional potential. One of the most powerful is the sigh. Ah. A great deal of music picks up on that pitch pattern and turns it into something called the appoggiatura. The appoggiatura is this. There's a little tension that's immediately released. Yeah. And you hear it right at the beginning of Barber's Adagio for Strings. You recognize that? You take that out, it's not so powerful. Another, another. Yeah, da, da. Now, if I take that tune and I pull out all the appoggiaturas, all those sighs, I fill it them out, and this is what it sounds like. Would you bite? I've, I've made it impotent, effectively, emotionally impotent. No one would be singing that in 40 years' time. Music has picked up on this speech pattern of the sigh, concentrated it, and then music colors it in a huge variety of ways that we instantly recognize as agonizing, um, wistful, or whatever, almost infinite number of ways. It's as if the sigh is being turned into a little dart that goes right into your soul, and it's very specific. We learn early on to read these sounds, and this makes music a potent channel of empathy. Two friends of mine, one in Cambridge, the other now in Jerusalem, have published a lot of research on this in a particularly interesting paper recently on long-term musical group interaction and its effect on empathy in children. This is 8 to 11-year-olds demonstrating the enormous potential of music to create immediate and long-lasting empathy. A Duke student said to me the other day, you can't demonize someone you've just made music with because you've communicated at this deep, empathetic level. And here's just one example of that played out. The East-West Divan Orchestra, these are young musicians gathered from Arab and Jewish backgrounds under the conductor Daniel Barenboim, a social experiment, you might say. Radically opposed ethnic groups producing astonishing sounds. 
Baron Vaughan's friend, Edward Said, has written that here we learn that music can be, quote, an expression not only of what life is, but an expression of what life could be or what it could become. Third and last, the way music coordinates us rhythmically. Very often when you hear music, you tap your feet or bob your head or move slightly. We move to music. Music moves us in more ways than one. This is something called entrainment, and it's been the focus of a great deal of research recently. Now, of course, there are times when we may want to sit still when we listen to music. That's okay. But even then, our neurological motor systems, I gather, are likely moving with the beat. There's a kind of internal dance going on in the brain that matches up to the music's rhythm. And it is worth bearing in mind that worldwide, and certainly historically, moving to music has been the norm. Sitting still has been the unusual thing. Anthropological studies suggest that this is one of the things that makes music such a powerful means of social bonding. Experiments show that when someone taps their finger in time with a metronome, they'll be much more accurate when they try to synchronize with someone else doing the same thing. The two adapt to each other, and they get a huge thrill, a kind of neurological thrill, out of getting it together an intense sense of being at one with each other. Just think of the power of music at a rock concert or at a New Orleans funeral march. It quickly generates a sense of coordination, shared purpose, shared vision. Daniel Levitin, professor of psychology and behavioral neuroscience at McGill University, has written, I believe that synchronous, coordinated song and movement were what created the strongest bonds between early humans. Music synchronizes us to each other, and this is another way it can strengthen a sense of shared vision. More than that, this process of moving to music and moving with others who move to music can be profoundly healing. Indeed, I believe it is one of the ways God uses music to heal us. In his remarkable book, Musicophilia, Oliver Sacks, a clinical neurologist, writes of a patient called Clive Waring, a musician, no less, stricken with severe amnesia in 1985. From one minute to the next, Clive doesn't know who, where, or what he is. He's now in his 70s. Only two things keep him together, a deep love for his wife and the ability to sing or play any piece of music put in front of him. Oliver Sacks writes, music is like a rope let down from heaven. Without performance, the thread is broken, and he's thrown back once again into the abyss. In other words, a piece of music gives him something with temporal flow and rhythm, something that moves from a meaningful past to a hoped-for future. God, Christians say, is in the business of re-timing us, he wants us to give us a future to hope for that's rooted in what He's done in the past, and to give us rhythms in our lives that will remind us of that, rhythms of grace. Some final words from the band U2. Sing your heart out, sing my heart out. I found grace inside a sound. I found grace, it's all that I found, and I can breathe, breathe now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Here, let's go ahead and sit down. You want to sit in the middle? Don't middle. you just want him to go on for the entire I know. hour? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything to say after that. I don't believe that. Not at all. I don't believe. <laughs> I don't believe it. Over they to you. Too well. Over to you, Norman. We do want to open that up to Norman to respond, reflect. <laughs> My response is I'm so excited by everything you just said that I don't know where to begin. And I so profoundly agree with all of it. And uh, it, it, the way you present it is, is, is so exciting and helpful. Um, I, I really don't know where to start, but I, I, I want to uh, start with some of the ideas you ex expressed about 
music be an, an empathetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and please do, because you'll have experienced this. So well, I, I, I do, it, it, in my work, I'm lucky enough to experience that all the time. And uh, what you say about the fact that it's much more difficult to have a disagreement with somebody after you've made music with them, I find to be so, Interesting so idea. true on so many levels at, because, because by its very nature, it's a collegial uh, process. Uh, particularly in a chorus, which is where I spend a, a lot of, of my life. And I'm reminded, uh, I was just writing this down as you were speaking, I'm reminded of a, a quote by another one of my heroes, uh, Robert Shaw, yes. uh, with whom I was fortunate enough to work for so many years. And he says, uh, the arts, and we could translate that to music for today's purposes, uh, may indeed not be the luxury of the few, Absolutely. but perhaps the last best hope of human beings to inhabit with joy this planet. Did he say that? He, he's, uh, I, I believe I'm quoting him correctly because I, I love that quote so much. And that seems to me to, to, to speak Absolutely. very much to what, what you're talking about. It's often, music's often treated as this kind of frivolous extra, but any anthropological study mm -hmm. tells you something very, very different. And most, most anthropologists now believe that, that music and language evolved very much together and then went their separate ways, that music and language have a kind of common root in in something that's neither quite music and not quite language, but like emotionally toned vocalizations, and then went their separate ways. So music then, and that, and, then, and particularly with all the rhythm stuff, it becomes something much more fundamental to being human, rather than we've made it so often this extra for the mm -hmm. elites or the rich or whatever, but no community of, of any socioeconomic standing does without music right. so far. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also, uh, on the empathetic piece, it is, um, I loved what you were saying about how it, there is something that happens just to our bodies yes. that then puts us in sync with each other, and that kind of uh, kind of a physiological empathy happens. Yep. But then you add to that text that are uh, so often powerful. Right. I, I always get a lump in my throat. Those of you who are Trinity uh, members, there's a line in one of our hymns that says, "We who cannot live without you." Think about that on Sunday morning, the people who are in this room who can, we're not like uber dependent people. I mean, this is a super achievement oriented crowd and, and all together we, we, we acknowledge this profoundly uh, humble and human reality that we cannot live without God. Mm. And so that, that and, and it is truly, that, that, uh, those moments, I think, in worship are, um, are what you're getting at with that, that ability to truly create a unified, yeah. empathetic, yeah. yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm struck uh, by uh, music's unique power to be transformative. And uh, it's transformative if, if one person sits down at a piano and plays a fugue by Bach. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's communicative and transformative if 200 people get in a room and yep. try to master the complexities of a, a Beethoven Mises Lemus. I mean, I'm, I'm just so, and I think in a sense, that kind of communication, the sort of empathy that that creates is something at the very highest level that's not available anywhere else in our fractured culture. I think today. that's right. I think that's right. I mean, I, it, it, it's astonishing to me, uh, pardon me for digressing to my own experience, but I, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and thank you again, uh, Robert Shaw, for, for beginning this in Atlanta, but he felt so strongly that that power was so important in people's lives, and it was very important to have a totally amateur chorus that would function at the highest possible professional level and be able to sing with a symphony Fantastic, orchestra. fantastic. Uh, and and I, I, I see his legacy every Monday night when I go uh, and conduct a symphony chorus rehearsal. 175 people uh, leave their jobs, get in their car, fight Atlanta traffic. Uh, some of them live quite far away. They, it takes them an hour to get there. Uh, they walk down the steps into a slightly dingy rehearsal hall. Uh, they have to stare at a dictatorial conductor who's going to beat them up for the next two and a half hours. Uh, they're going to engage in a process that is by its very nature tiring and requires every bit of intellectual and, and uh, emotional capacity that is available to yep. them. That, that is trying to seek some sort of perfection when you know you'll never get there. 
I mean, none of us will ever deliver a perfect performance of the Bach B minor mass or the Beethoven Mesa Solemnis. But ultimately, that's not the point. The point is, what is the process Absolutely. doing for us? May I ask you a question about empathy, then? You're conducting a course. Your back is to the audience. Mm. What's, the, what's the empathy between you and audience? What stops it just being a show for yourselves? And do you think about the audience at all? Do you sense that empathy? Do you sense the connection? If I'm on the podium, I think about what my job is. <laughs> yeah, which you ought to. Which is that I can't completely enjoy myself. You no, know, no, no conductor Absolutely. can. Absolutely. Because you, you, you want to get out of the way of the music. You want to be a vehicle so that the people in front of you on stage, can, uh, that the electricity of what is happening there can leap over the That's scene. what I was hoping you would say. Yes. And, and, and so I feel, I feel very much, uh, uh, in, in, in a wonderful performance at least, uh, whether I'm conducting it or somebody else's, or I'm experiencing it, or singing in it, or playing in it, that there is a unique kind of uh, communication. But happening. there are times when you're going to feel an enthusiasm from the audience before you begin Absolutely. that must lift you. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. That, so there's that, there's that communication. That's very true. And, 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 and in like manner, you can feel boredom from the yeah, audience. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm glad you, so you well. said the thing about my concert. I'm on the notes. People at organists and choir directors and worship leaders I work with a lot get terribly anxious. Oh, I'm, I'm thinking about D major. I'm not thinking about the Lord. The Lord wants you to think about D major yeah, at that yeah. point. You know. I, I, I totally and, and agree. He, and he'd like it to be in tune as well. You know, so it, I, I, don't I, be embarrassed. I, it is your ministry at that, at that time. Exactly. Not for the rest of your life, but at that time, it's your ministry. I, I, I promise I won't make another Robert Shaw quote all afternoon. But, but another one of my favorites is, the dove is much more likely to descend if you clean out the cage. First. That's great. That's <laughs> great. <laughs> lovely. I love it. That, that, that is sort that's of, superb. That, that's exactly what we spend our lives doing superb. here in Absolutely. this choir and down that. And, and, and why, what, what is also fascinating to me, why do people want to do it? Why do they want to give up 70 nights a year to, to, to do this? Yeah. Uh, it's because they are hungry for it. It's because there is... A, a, a sort of a, a holy thing about that activity. There's a spiritual connection, at, it, especially in very great music, yes. of that kind of, of complexity. Course. Of course, That is just not available to them anywhere else. And, and if, it, the, the, if you're lucky, uh, you get to the end, and what you realize is the, the whole is so much greater than the sum oh, of the parts. Absolutely. You, you make the most valuable or the best contribution you can to what's going on. It's, it's a sort of an anonymous contribution in a large chorus. And yet, what you get out of it is miraculous. Yes. And it, 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 you know, it speaks to me that across all cultures and across all religions, uh, if you believe in a supreme being, then one of the defining aspects, let's say, of that supreme being is a creative aspect. The creator is about the job of creating. That's perhaps the supreme act. So, so I hope that when I engage or I encourage other people to engage in a musical activity, that that is that same mm -hmm. sort of a, 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 a small version of that holy creative process and that we're able to touch something eternal. Does that make any Absol sense? How, how, do you get, how do you get people to listen to each other? And could you demonstrate that for us? I can. <laughs> well, I can demonstrate a, a very quick little thing. Uh, we often begin a rehearsal. Uh, this is another gift from, from Shaw. Uh, and I do it with this choir as well. Great. Uh, as I said, people come from all over the place. They do different jobs. Most of them are not professional musicians. Some of them are educators. Some of them are professional musicians. Uh, the point is to uh, get them to be able to channel and to focus and get into the task at hand. And there's a very simple way to do that. Uh, if you all sit up very straight, because you can't sing slouched over, it's hard and to gentlemen, if you take that pitch, and ladies, if you take that pitch, and you'll sing a very, very pure, round, hooty valve. Ready? Now keep going. Now just hold that steady. Take a breath and come back if you have to. But try to get that pitch to be the purest possible pitch. Try to make the same darkish, hooty quality that your neighbor is making and then try to sublimate your individual vocalism into that sound. And keep your breath active so that it's kind of spinning. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel that? Yeah. Very I good. felt it up here. That, that was remarkable how that unified everybody. Marvel. You're right. and, 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 and let me do one more. This side of the room sing that pitch. That side of the room sing that pitch. Now wait, breathe with me. The first deal is you have to start together. 
So you breathe as my hand goes up. Now just hold that steady and spin it and make it pure. It's a gorgeous sound. Use the room as your sounding board. Yeah, so what I'm starting to hear now is that you're immediately focusing on am I in tune? Am I singing at the same dynamic as my neighbor? You know, and this is such a simple thing. We're not doing anything complex here, but we're, we're, we're I hope, yeah, functioning absolutely. and listening in a different way. So that I actually heard, for example, what you were talking about with the overtones in the piano. Absolutely, I'm just gonna say the harmonics. Right, right. You, you can hear this, mm -hmm. which is the fifth, and that. You, That's you, right. You actually get more of a chord than, than you're singing, which is a very mathematical process. The octave is a two to one relationship, and the fifth that you sing is what, a three to two relationship? Could we, tr could we extend that then and say, could you sing that again and pick out notes that you hear on top? When we see they pick up and, harmonics? And, and then they sing them. Yeah. Yeah, great. Sing any other notes you hear with that. Uh, so we'll, we'll start in the same way. This is how this, they did in the medieval era. This is how chords were developed in exactly. Western music. Exactly. Just in very spacious buildings. In, in, in a space like this, people yeah. notice this, yeah. So you're singing Lou, and you're singing actually have a better way to do it. Yeah, we can go ahead and lower it down. Now you're going to sing knee and on cue, you're going to go to all. That's a more open vowel. That'll set the room yeah, vibrating right. a little bit better. All right, knee. Now round that and darken it. Knee. Knee, knee, knee. Now begin to crescendo and then go to all. Now crescendo. Hear those other pitches? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that you get. Yeah, lovely sound. Wow. Bit, uh, superb. <laughs> we can make a CD of this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely superb. That says it all. And that was without instrumental accompaniment. That didn't need an organ. In fact, it probably didn't even need if I may say so, an excellent musician, because you didn't, you didn't even have to sing no, that. No, didn't, didn't just, need just one note, I yeah. know. Yeah, so it's fantastic. Wonderful. A wonderful uh, example of, uh, it, w one of the things I was picking up when you were saying is that music does force us also to listen. Uh, and and I, I think listening really is one of the core spiritual practices of the Christian right. life. Um, Years ago, I worked with youth ministers, um, and there, I was asked to do a seminar for them because, you know, nobody could manage their time well, and everybody was uh, out of balance, right? You know, the whole life-work balance thing that everybody tries to achieve. Uh, and we, 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 I remember doing this, um, this exercise on this enormous, uh, almost seesaw thing where every, like, 40 people were on there, and it was, let's all try to get it to balance. And so, you know, everybody moves and touches and moves this way, moves this way, and fi finally, for one short, maybe second and a half, it's balanced, and then somebody breathes. And then it's unbalanced again. And I became very aware of how the metaphor of balance for trying to uh, put a life together uh, was lacking. For one thing, it, it was almost always fleeting. I wonder if any of you can relate to that. You know, you work really hard for this work-life balance, whatever, and you, and you get it for three days. And then, you know, somebody breathes, and it's gone. And I began to replace the, the notion of how do you manage a life well, rather than trying to balance, to, uh, to seek to be in a holy rhythm. And, uh, you know, rhythm being this, these intervals of sound and silence. And I think rhythm is really rooted uh, theologically in the creation narrative. Right? So the, that this is, Absolutely. This is uh, the, the activity, the creativity, and the rest of God, this rhythm, is, uh, is, is really what we're seeking in our lives. When, we're, when we speak of balance, maybe what we're really seeking, even deeper than that, is to be connected to a holy rhythm. And, and that requires listening. It requires uh, listening and then participating. It's less that I'm trying to impose something on the components of my life. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to impose, but I take the components of my life and compose something with them. I receive them as gifts and compose something beautiful out of them, like 
uh, the parts of music. So that has been a really helpful in terms of how, you know, one of the ways that music can be a gateway into the holy, just changing that metaphor, yes, uh, it can be it's very lovely. powerful. It's lovely. May I pick up on that and just take it one stage Please. further? On the rhythm thing, we kind of were not careful, to, and I made up given the suggestion, just think of it as a kind of rigid, mechanical, metronomic thing. Again, I, I'm not a neurophysiologist, but, but actually my father was, but we never talked about these things. But a, a fair amount of research has shown that humans crave that at the same time as craving for flexibility yes, around yeah. it. Yes. And that seems to be built into, uh, as they would say these days, hardwired into our physiological systems. Now, that, that, is, that has massive implications for indeed patterns of prayer, yes, liturgy, yes. the Christian life that, that you're talking about. Yes. It also, the, and I often, it has very good implications for the way you play music and the way we hear it. I was listening to Norman this morning playing his, one of his many voluntaries. Uh, it was actually during communion. He was playing a piece by Bach. Bach is so often played metronomically and with a kind of regularity that's absolutely killing. And Bach was really, a lot of the time, having a lot of fun. And he had that kind of chuckle at the side. And so, for instance, um, if you play kind of toccata movements of Bach like this, You can go to piano competitions and hear these 13 and 14 year olds yeah. who've learnt every note, you know, they go. We call it toothbrush music. It's unbelievably dull and your brain is like that. Now you see, that's regularity. Right. But without any joy, as it yes, were, without yes, any improvisation. Exactly, yes. So the trick is to do things like. Yes. And now it's turned into music. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Um, I'm not playing it strictly. I played the first note slightly longer. And here I go again. Rather than... Did you hear me? Oh, sorry. I might just slow down slightly there. Mm. So there's still got to be that sense of regularity. Let's call it faithfulness. Yes. Faithfulness and steadiness but around that, a flexibility. And that's, I think that's about the Holy Spirit, yeah. you know, frankly, it's about that, the Holy Spirit. That's the best argument for free will I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, no, it's, a, it's exactly, yeah. the, the, without, without both of those poles, life collapses. Right. Exactly. But it becomes horrendous, it becomes totalitarian. It's, uh, it's like the Nazis, jackboots, whatever, yeah. if it's just the first. Right. And the right. tribes are many ways, you know, playing Bach, actually on the organ as well, if you're not careful. Um, that make you think, oh gosh, this is just churned out by a mathematician. No, no. It, Bach, Bach is a mathematician, but it's always an open mathematics. Mm -hmm. It's always yes. slightly irregular. It's always a bit jazzy. He's a jazz musician, Bach. <laughs> he is, isn't he? It's pure jazz, a lot of it, I think. It sounds so improvised. It sounds so improvised. I, I love the fact that you say you have to have both, though. Yes. Uh, absolutely, you, of course. Music is an art that exists in time. Time is able to be equally subdivided, Episode. and you have to have a, a clean, a, a, and, and has to have a steady pulse, just like your heartbeat. Yeah. There's, there's something very phys physiological going on. Uh, talk about that a little bit. I, you've, you've talked about that a lot in your books, the, the sort of the physiology of rhythm. And yes, I think, I mean, uh, rhythm, of course, our perception of rhythm is, is built into heartbeat, mm -hmm. and left, right, walking, a whole lot of neurological systems. And, uh, and Christians are frightened of saying that music has a lot to do with the body, as if there's something a little bit iffy about that. It's okay if it goes to our mind or this thing called our heart. But no, it involves the whole of us. Amen. Um, and music is a very, very physical business. Uh, if, you're, if you're playing a difficult piece, uh, I didn't tell you, you're not actually thinking of holy or spiritual or terrifically emotional things even. You're thinking about getting the notes, because it, and it's exhausting and you're sweating. And that physical involvement is part of the fun, of course, as well. So it's a form of dance, effectively. Um, I'm always interested that there's, in many cultures there's no word for music. There's only a word that, or a, a cluster of words that would mean something like bodily movement with sound. Really? 
uh, because, because music is seen as so inherently bodily and involving bodily motion and bodily processes right from the start. And the body is not an unfortunate thing that music happens to get played into, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we've, we've talked a lot about both conscious and, and, and sort of subconscious channels that music gets us in relationship to eternity and to mm. holy things. And uh, I find, and uh, I know you do too, it, it fascinating that across uh, many cultural divides, mm -hmm. and just in music, for example, in, 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 in pop music, in so-called serious music, mm -hmm. which seems to have a dwindling audience and so forth, so many uh, creators or composers in our day, both sacred and secular, mm -hmm turn to religious and, and, and spiritual, so-called spiritual things. Definitely. The big word is spiritual right Definitely. now. But uh, the reason I'm thinking of this a lot right now, and I'd love your take on this, uh, is that uh, we've commissioned uh, a, a wonderful young American composer by the name of uh, Christopher Theophanides yes. uh, to write us a choral and, and orchestral I know very piece. Well. And it's, uh, yeah, yes, and, yes. Uh, well, yeah. uh, we've worked with him several times, a great guy. And it is a creation oratorio. Mm. Uh, the title is, is, is uh, Creation you know slash Creator. We're going to premiere it in April. Shameless plug, ASO, April, <laughs> you can hear it. Uh, wow. And, and it's, it's very complex and difficult stuff. But to me, it is so representative of the strands of, uh, yes. that are going on culturally and spiritually today in that he takes uh, creation myths or traditions from Christian, Hindu, yes. Sufi, and so forth, yes. and combines them. And then in the next movement, you'll get poetry by James Weldon Johnson, Truman Capote quotes, yes. you know, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, and it, it, it sounds as though it could be an absolute hodgepodge, but because it is within a framework and a structure that is musical. Yes, I see. It is, so the music holds it together. It, it holds yes. it together. Yes, yeah. it's interesting. I mean, Chris is also interesting, and he's, as far as I know, he's not a believer, not a Christian, no, not a Christian so. believer. Yeah. And, I was involved in a collaboration with him. He, he's at Yale uh, in connection with T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. Um, but he's, he's, he's um, a kind of symbol of a certain kind of person that I'm meeting more and more these days yeah. who may not be overtly Christian mm -hmm. or have a particular religious conviction, but are ready for a conversation. Right. And the media, or the, the medium through which that conversation happens is music. Exactly. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I, as, a, as a believing Christian, I, wanted, I, I want to take things further, of course, and be more specific, but I want a conversation. And the trouble is, we're in a culture when the, even that conversation is a very, very hard one. But I work a lot in the music department at Cambridge, which is very suspicious of anything religious or Christian, <laughs> I think. Uh, I could go on record in saying that. Not officially so, but, but that's going to be. But I find people, in, when you use the right kind of musical language, as it were, and take them into indeed some of the great sacred works of the past, they're very, very interested yeah. in, what, in what makes things. I mean, for instance... Um, very natural. No, I better, not, I better not name the person, but an extremely distinguished British composer came to see me once, who's a vigorous atheist, and, he's, and he said, I've been asked to speak about music and religion in Japan in a lecture in, to in Tokyo. I thought, oh, gosh, this will be interesting. And I was absolutely terrified of this man because he's, he's awesome, and New Schoenberg and all that kind of, you yeah. know, we're that kind of league. Right. And, but he was very gracious, and I, so very early on, I talked about the Trinity. I talked about the patterns of sound, the way that sounds can overlap in the same space, and we either hear them as different. And he said, I never thought about that before. <laughs> and he got out his notebooks, and he wanted to know all about the doctrine of the Trinity. Wow. This is an atheist. But, so it was an extraordinary, but I couldn't have imagined a conversation about the doctrine of the Trinity with him in any other any way, because mm -hmm. he was intellectually, at least on one level, intellectually utterly resistant and closed to any such talk. And so I find that a fascinating thing, and we've, uh, yeah, we, we, we failed to carry on that correspondence. We really we ought to, but I can, many, many stories like that, which has happened. And, um, there's a book in there for you somewhere. There's a book, I was going to say there probably is. <laughs> the pro yeah, I think maybe there is. That's a conversation our culture yeah, needs. Absolutely it is. And, and, and exactly what we're talking about is such a gateway to that. Yeah. conversation. Don't you feel also that, that it can be used in a very negative yes. way? You, 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 uh, there, there are all sorts of theories that were for years in this country that people are afraid of silence. And so you get into an elevator and immediately what do you hear? Oh, I Terrible know. music <laughs> blaring at you because you might have to turn to the person next to you and actually interact a little bit. Or you, or you get onto a, an airplane and they're trying to soothe you uh, and, and help you not think about plunging into the ocean <laughs> or something with, with, with lovely, quiet, 
I know. music, you know, and I, I that's, know. A, that's a, a form of musical communication in a way, but it's hard for me because I just think it's, a, it's the, sort of the wrong way. Andre Previn was on a plane once and they got into a terrible thunderstorm and they played in those days Mantovani's Silky Strings. <laughs> and, and he called over the flight attendant and said, what's that? He said, we play this music because it soothes, it soothes the passengers. And he says, I'd rather die to Brahms Requiem than... <laughs> 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 but I may, I may just say on the silence thing, and it may pick up on something, Pam, that, that you were saying, or at least hinting towards it, I think use well, one of the great things music can do yes. is teach us that silence need not be empty. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much silence built into great music, it can give you a sense that silence can be full. The reason why culture is frightened of silence is because they think silence means void, it means mm -hmm. empty, it means nothing exactly. happened. Can I have a very quick story on that? I was visiting Baylor University. Anyone from Baylor? Texas, Baylor? Anyone know about that? <laughs> right, it's compulsory chapel there, and there are 1,800 in a darkened theater I was asked to speak to. I was given 18 minutes and not one second longer, and they had, they had the clock <laughs> right there. And all the lights were turned down. As so you've got 18 minutes, they do not want to be there, Mr. Begbie, it's very hostile, and they'll be very restless. I said, why are the lights out? It's because otherwise they'll be reading papers and doing whatever. This is the only way um, we can stop them doing other things. I said, good, that, that sounds exciting. So, there I was, <laughs> absolute darkness. It was like a great seething mass of unseen resentment. Okay. And, and it was like those awful horror films, you know, the kind of cockroaches and yeah. they oh, uh, you know. So, and they were just, <laughs> they, it was sheer hostility. And so I tried all sorts of things and, you know, and I played the piano, but there's a story about And then I did one thing out of intro, I was talking about silence. <laughs> absolute silence yeah. in those two seconds. Yeah. Absolute silence. Remember, it's, it's, it's when you stop the car, the baby wakes up. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so now great music, of course, is replete with silence. There's also perhaps some not such great music. <laughs> that's, that's not a very nice kind of silence. But it's interesting, There's, it's more silence than music in the first half minute of that film music. Um, so I think music has a lot to tell us about recovering a sense of full silence. Yes. No and right. that's incredibly important for prayer and contemplative yes. because people Meditation. are very frightened of that kind of prayer yes. because they think it's going to mean emptiness. Yes. When it's really about fullness. It's yes. about, as in that music, you've got a promise of what's been for what will be. Right. So a silence can be full. And so you learn how to wait again. Teaches, the music teaches us how to wait. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I think also that uh, the idea of, you know, Sabbath, rest, it's not just That's right. doing nothing. Nothing, it's exactly. It's not just, you not know, switching it, off. Right. Yes. It's yeah. not, uh, you know, going from full throttle to dead on the couch watching Law and Order, although I, I've done that. Um, oh, but okay. it's, it, it, that Sabbath is that time, that, that silence it's full, that it's is full. full. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Yeah. So thank you so much. We are at the end of our time. Thank you, Jeremy and Norman. They all and, learned um, so much. From thank you very much. Bravo, bravo, bravo. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.